field that is being used as a replacement for animal therapy in nursing homes, which is really kind of awesome. So she builds planets on Earth, you guys. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very special event, Future Stages, Live Performance in COVID Times. I'm James Wetzel. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I am the producer of adult programs at the Museum of Science Boston. I'm coming to you live from the Suit Cabot studio, and I'm so excited to introduce our special guest this evening, uh, actor, creator, and scrappy storyteller, Brendan Bradley. As we all know, due to the ongoing pandemic, live performance of all genres has come to a stop. Uh, and with it, so has our ability to enjoy the art that we love as part of a live audience. However, Brendan may have the answer to getting live performance back on its feet before the end of the pandemic through a platform and technology that he has called Future Stages. And tonight we are so lucky to have Brendan here with us uh, virtually to take us into the world of Future Stages and show us all the amazing capabilities that come along with it. And tonight is a part of our current fall virtual season of adult programming. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup of free virtual events happening every week through the end of the year including our very special symposium with Dr. Ibram X. Kendi next Wednesday night. Uh, so I encourage you to go to mos.org slash adults and check out that full lineup. You can register for your spot uh, in all those events and make sure while you're there that you sign up for our email list so you can stay up to date on everything happening here at the Museum of Science for adults. Now I'll be back a little bit later on tonight for a Q&A with Brendan. So as questions come to mind, you can submit those at any point starting right now by going to slide slido.com and entering the code future stages all one word once again that's slido s-l-i-d-o.com with the code future stages um, i need to thank our friends from the lowell institute for their continued support of the adult programming here at the museum without them we would not be here tonight this event would not be happening and it would not be free so please join me in giving a huge round of applause out there for the lowell institute and finally, at the end of the talk tonight, I ask you to go to donate.mos.org slash MOS at home and consider making a gift to allow us to keep bringing free STEM experiences into your homes just like tonight. Once again, that's donate.mos.org slash MOS at home. But now it's my pleasure to turn it over to uh, our special guest, Brendan Bradley with Future Stages. Take it away, Brendan. think of yourself as actually dead, lying in a box with the lid on it. Nor do I really. So we'd be depressed by it. I mean, one thinks of it like being alive in a box. One keeps forgetting to take into account the fact that one is dead, which should make a difference, shouldn't it? I mean, you never know you were in a box, would you? It would be just like being asleep in a box. <gasps> oh, not that I'd like to sleep in a box, mind you. <laughs> not without any air. You'd wake up dead for a start, and then where would you be? Apart from inside a box. That's the bit I don't like, frankly. That's why I don't think of it. Because you'd be helpless, wouldn't you? Stuffed in a box like that, I mean, You'd be in there forever. Even taking into account the fact that you're dead, it isn't a pleasant thought, especially if you're dead. <laughs> Let me ask yourself, if I asked you straight off, I'm going to stuff you in this box, now would you rather be alive or dead? Now would you rather be alive or dead? Naturally, you'd prefer to be alive. Life in a box is better than no life. At all. I expect. You'd have a chance at least. Well, you could lie there thinking, well, at least I'm 
not dead. In a minute, someone's going to bang on the lid and tell me to come out. <gasps> hey, you, what's your name? Come out of there. Welcome to the future stages, coming to you from a variety of boxes as we explore ubiquitous technology and live storytelling. I'm Brendan Bradley, an actor, writer, director, producer, and scrappy storyteller, and I've spent the last 20 years obsessed with micro-budget storytelling using new tools for new audiences. That was a piece from Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead, based on a little-known play called Hamlet by William Shakespeare. In Mr. Stoppard's adaptation, our two titular characters are backstage, waiting in the wings of a production of Hamlet, trying to piece together what's going on on stage without them. I can attest to this experience having been in several productions of Hamlet, twice in the role of Laertes, which I maintain is one of the most overlooked roles in all of Shakespeare. You've got one charming scene at the top of Act One, and then you leave stage for three acts, and you return with a fiery speech at the king, mourning the death of your sister, a flashy sword fight, and a death scene. Huzzah! But like our friend Rosencrantz, you are backstage for what feels like an eternity. The box monologue has been a popular audition piece for myself and many other performers over the years, but I thought tonight it might offer new meaning as we examine the state of live performance during the global pandemic. For those that don't know, it is very difficult to make theater right now. Storytelling in any medium requires very close collaboration, shouting in each other's faces, doing dance and fight choreography, and kissing our co-workers every night. It is tough work, but someone has got to do it. But the real joy comes from the connection with a live audience. That palpable feeling of being trapped in a room with strangers and sharing a collective catharsis. But Broadway has gone dark until March of next year at the earliest, and theaters around the world are closing their doors or struggling in endless fundraiser mode, just trying to keep the lights on. So I thought tonight we could look at the words of Rosencrantz to determine whether life in a box really is better than no life at all, as we unpack tools from my own career before, during, and I hope after COVID-19. Rosencrantz begins the speech with a question, do you ever think of yourself as actually dead, lying in a box with the lid on it? Like many great dramatists, Tom Stoppard is inviting us to think the unthinkable, our own mortality. This is a theme in many great works of art and a topic we have all become far too familiar with over the last year. We've all been forced to think the unthinkable, the health and safety of ourselves, our families, and our community, the sudden loss of entire industries and livelihoods, and for the sake of tonight's conversation, the death of theater. Can we continue the tradition, culture, and business of live entertainment if we cannot congregate? Now, I want to be clear, this is not my thesis tonight. These are the existential fears that have slipped into my DMs and trolled my social media over the last few months. Quite to the contrary, in my career, the lack of access to traditional performance opportunities has merely been an invitation to build new ones. I produced my first play as a teenager because my high school didn't have access to an auditorium at the time. I performed on stage for audiences of four people to 4,000 people in bars, parks, fields, classrooms, swimming pools, and even on the boards of the famed Globe Theater in London. I produced my first feature film by cold calling tourisms, uh, tourism boards to sponsor me and my team across three continents. I debuted a science fiction series at Comic-Con by building a spaceship in my one-bedroom apartment, actually right where I'm standing right now. And my upcoming adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth uses an Xbox to turn my actors into virtual reality characters. Like another great playwright, George Bernard Shaw says, don't wait for the right opportunity, create it. To answer Rosencrantz's question, I have thought the unthinkable time and time and time again, looking for every possible box 
to tell stories for a living. A few years ago, I approached my alma mater, New York University, about establishing an initiative for combining emerging technologies and live performance. The Brendan Bradley Integrative Technology Lab has become one of the largest cross-departmental collaborations at the school with students from the drama department, creative writing, filmmaking, gaming, computer sciences, all working with real-world technologists who are eager for creative case studies to unlock the artistic potential of their products. In the last three years, our students have created a motion capture performance, a 360 audio experience, and two live performances inside virtual reality. So when the museum asked me to give a talk tonight, I just saw it as another opportunity for live performance. And if that is not your cup of tea, there is still time to get out. But if you will indulge me for the next hour, I'd like to reach out to my fellow artists and creative institutions who are grappling with the largest existential crisis of our generation. All of us, including Tom Stoppard, are echoing the most famous and overquoted lines from William Shakespeare's work. To be or not to be. That's a misfire on the cue because it's a live show. So let's go back. To be or not to be. Important that everybody sees it. I actually put this speech in a box a few years ago when I ran a YouTube channel called The Digital Stage which looked to curate 450 Shakespeare monologues for Shakespeare's 450th birthday. At the time, it felt so bizarre to bring digital cinematic techniques to such theatrical language. But as we've learned, as the entire world has become a video chat, it's important to standardize some basic practices when collaborating on video across the world. So. We framed for head and shoulders so that our talent would fill the frame on the green screen. That comes later. <laughs> would fill the frame but not overwhelm it if the audience was on uh, a larger screen. A cinematographer and friend of mine, Jared Hoy, let me borrow a professional grade camera and lens as well as a professional microphone. A quick word of advice, if you want to elevate your own video content, the first and most important purchase is a good microphone because audiences actually watch with their ears. We built a giant ring light to illuminate our talent, and we backlit everyone to give them some separation from that backdrop. As we were uh, just discussing, <laughs> we've got this big monster out back here that everybody is familiar with. You also notice I have a pink cast on the back of my head, and that's actually a quick trick to separate that green spill from a green screen. Just a little trick for you. This all helps to really put your audience or your performers inside of a standardized stage and backdrop to really unify your scene. We didn't want to rely on camera tricks and editing and instead wanted to build the most dynamic static image to support our performances and the words. These days it feels so commonplace to set up all this equipment and stare down the barrel of a quick camera but it felt so bizarre back then to say these lines to no one and everyone. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by sleep to say we end the heartache and thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of a despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy taketh when he himself might as quiet as make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? But that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. 
and thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly o'er with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pitch and moment in this regard their current turn away and lose the name of action. Oh, heavy stuff. I thought this was a family show. It's a Thursday night, Brendan. You're not wrong. Your lack of applause is noticeable. No one wants to think of this stuff, and so we don't. The next line of Rosencrantz's speech, nor do I really, silly to be depressed by it. Mortality is scary. So let's just make a joke and ignore it. And for the first few months of quarantine, this is exactly what the theater community did. On April 20th, the New York Times described Broadway and the West End as literal ghost towns. Just one week later, Richard Nelson's We Do Really Need to Talk About It premiered at the public theater via Zoom and was dubbed the first great play of quarantine by The New Yorker and the first original internet play by Variety. Allow me to be the first to warn you of the dangers of calling yourself the first of anything on the internet. Whether or not it was true, Zoom plays quickly became all the rage. There was this one and this one. And uh, this, this one had nice backdrops. And this one had no noses. Uh, this one actually called itself Zoom Feeder. And there was this one and this one. And this, we literally put feeder in a box. And of all the boxes, this isn't even a film platform. It's a video chat. It's not even HD. No, seriously, not to be a snob about this, but if we're going to put on our monocles and look down our noses about the purity of theater, then why did we choose a video platform that throttles video at 720p? Where are their legs? The stage picture, the movement. Isn't theater supposed to be about escapism? transporting the audience outside of their daily lives, then why did we choose to put theater in the one place that everybody has to do everything all the time now? Who wants to get off of a four-hour work call, FaceTime with grandma, and then go watch Zoom Checkoff? Nobody could have seen this coming. Except Tom freaking stoppered the next line of the speech. I mean, one thinks of it like being alive in a box. One keeps forgetting to take into account the fact that one is dead, which should make a difference, shouldn't it? Tom Stoppard points out that we can only think about life in the context in comparison to being dead. We could only think about theater based on what we'd already seen and experienced. But doesn't that betray the central creed of live performance. Once it's done, it's done. No show can ever be repeated. Each night we go to see new discovery, authentic innovation happening in real time. Okay, so hold your roll, Brendan. What is theater? What counts? What doesn't? Peter Brooks would say, I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. Someone walks across this space while someone else is watching them, and that is all that is required for an act of theater to be engaged. So maybe Zoom is just an empty space. Maybe these boxes are all that we require to engage theater. The artistic director of Actors Theater of Louisville, Robert Barry Fleming, says that theater is not a building, it is a movement. Should theater be defined and confined by a place? If the story is good enough, does it matter how and where we consume it? The quarantine forced my students to start rehearsing and meeting and performing in virtual reality. Based off of the timing of this, it picked up a little bit of press, and I was invited to Theater Communication Group's June conference, ambitiously entitled Reemergence. In June, I quickly realized that the conference itself was going to be held, you may have guessed, on Zoom, about theater that was being made on Zoom. So I asked if I could scrap my speech and instead try to devise a work of theater that utilized other 
ubiquitous streaming tools. They asked what that meant, and I said, let's find out. I remember doing regional Shakespeare in Omaha, Nebraska, in repertory. We were doing Henry V and Love's Labor's Lost. Thousands of people drive from all over the state to picnic in the giant green field and listen to Shakespeare as the sun sets. I had the opening speech of Love's Labor's Lost, and I will never forget opening night, walking out on stage with, Therefore, brave conquerors, for so you are, that war against your own affections and the huge army of the world's desires, and looking out at an army of faces having never performed for a crowd that size, and my mind went blank. Live theater, nothing like it, but it's Shakespeare. They don't know what I'm saying anyway. So I launched into 30 seconds of made up Shakespeare or what felt like 30 years as I wildly gestured for my castmates to come from the wings and save me. I am not proud of that performance and it never happened again. Henry V on the other hand opened much more smoothly with a beautiful speech about the audacity of any group of performers trying to bring to life battlefields and horses and years of events on a bare stage. And I thought this might be the perfect speech to provide a little snark at a theater conference held on Zoom. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. Oh, but pardon, and gentles all the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure can attest in little place a million, and let us ciphers to this great account on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies. <laughs> They're high upreared and abutting fronts, the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. We'll piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping over time turning the accomplishments of many years into an hour glass. For the which supply, admit me, chorus, to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge, our play. I mean, you'd never know you were in a box, would you? For $25 and some YouTube tutorials, I had transported myself to the actual fields of Agincourt and turned myself into a chorus of players with the touch of a button. Much like Shakespeare, so much of this technology is open source, free for artists to use right now. How can we say that live performance is dead? when the average professional streamer on Twitch makes over $30,000 a year based solely on their live interaction with a synchronous audience. So I downloaded some software called OBS or Open Broadcaster Software, which allows me to create a variety of scenes over here on the left side, which are kind of like traditional cues in a play. Inside of each of these scenes, I can add a variety of sources which is any video, audio, 
thing that I could come up with. Uh, I can mix this audio here in the center. I can add a variety of transitions. Don't want to take that one off. Uh, and then I can stream or record back out to anywhere in the world, which is pretty cool. I got a $12 tablecloth to remove my backdrop, a $4 app which turned my phone into a remote control, and a bunch of plugins that let me stream this whole thing back out anywhere in the world, especially on a video conferencing software as a virtual camera. Now, this could be a lot better. <laughs> the limitation here is me. I mean, without any collaborators, I just made a bunch of stuff up and streamed it back out to the world. But imagine working with an actual set designer to offer me 3D scenery, or a lighting designer to take me beyond my cheap LED ring light, or a stage manager to help me organize all this nonsense and run the show so I can focus on my performance instead of my phone. The nightmare of lost jobs and uncertainty could instead become a dream of limitless collaboration, leveraging the talent and experience of our stagecraft professionals while keeping them safe and distant. We could all sleep better at night. Uh-oh, there's that S word. Borrowed from our Shakespeare, and by sleep to say we end the heartache and thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream and echoed in our Rosencrantz, it would be just like you were asleep in a box. Not that I'd like to sleep in a box, mind you, not without any air. You'd wake up dead for a start, and then where would you be apart from inside a box? Sleep is a very popular metaphor for death, but sleep is also a metaphor for inaction. I think the reason that we latched on to Zoom so quickly is that it asked nothing of us in a time when everything was being asked of us. Life is hard. People are scared, unemployed, sick. I don't want to have to learn how to use OBS and some plugins. And what if I do all that work and my thing isn't very good? You know, like Brendan's. Uh-oh. Speaking of, no, no, come back. Come to me. Do it, robots. You can do it. Huzzah. Excellent. All right. Live theater, folks. Live theater. A off-Broadway theater company in New York approached me during the first month of quarantine about producing a virtual one-act festival. We engaged playwrights, actors, directors, started talking about dates, priced out equipment, but they pulled out at the last minute with a quote that I will never forget. Why are we buying all this stuff? We're a theater company, not a tech company. In a world in which everything is virtual, is there a difference? Stoppard points out to us that dead or alive or asleep, we all end up in a box. I just need to figure out what box I wanted to be in. I began making YouTube videos, exploring any open source technology that could bring performers together. Now, many of these technologies fall under the umbrella of XR, or extended reality, and fall into three categories, AR, VR, and MR. AR, or augmented reality, is when a virtual overlay goes on top of the real world. We see this every day on social media with filters that enhance our photos and our videos. VR, or virtual reality, is in an entirely closed off ecosystem made up of virtual and digitally captured elements, often experienced in one of those headsets you may have seen. And MR, or mixed reality, is when the virtual elements can actually detect or react to the real world. So, I might take a Snapchat filter and give myself a virtual costume or makeup. I could work with a lighting designer like the award-winning Peter Cohen, who created all of the virtual overlays for the beginning of tonight's show. Very impressive, far beyond what I could have imagined. Or I could use a game engine to be able to trigger animations to respond to my movements in the real world. But the most important virtual enhancement 
is other people. Scene partners who can react and respond to each other in real time. Other actors extending their realities from anywhere in the world. So how do we do this? <laughs> the streaming community has a few workarounds for this using social media and streaming tools, but you don't get a lot of customization over layout, kind of like the Brady Bunch box phenomenon on Zoom. And also, as I was discussing earlier, it really throttles that video quality, which can make removing everyone's backdrops and compositing them a struggle. So I started looking into what other ways I could take my entire cast and put them on the same network. I started working with IP cameras, security cameras, hunting cameras, and eventually baby monitor apps to be able to treat my entire cast as a family and put them on the same cloud network where I could pull down their HD videos as I needed them. We are still in very early days and there is not a perfect solution yet. So tonight, I'm actually gonna use a free tool called OBS ninja that you can access on your web browser if you want to try from home and i have some lovely volunteers from the museum who are going to help with today's experiment let's say hello to james and danny hello hello, hello. who are on the new green screen stages at the museum of science i'm going to do some shakespeare what pinch me I'm dreaming. I'm gonna remove their green screen, composite them into a little scene for us to do. And while that, I'm reminded of another one of Shakespeare's characters who was dropped into a world of magic where no one would believe him. How appropriate that Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream features a group of mechanicals, or regular working folks, who take it upon themselves to badly put on a play. Their work is actually selected by the royal court because of its rough edges that offer levity to its viewers. But not before the weed player Nick Bottom goes on a transformative journey, a dream. While like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, he is taking a quick nap while waiting in the wings for his cue. So for today, James, I'd love if you would play Titania, the queen of the fairies, who has had fairy dust sprinkled in her eyes to fall in love with Nick Bottom, who has, by the way, been turned into a donkey. And Danny, if you could play Cobweb and Mustard Seed, who are two of the other fairies that are somewhat concerned about your queen's new life choices. I'm going to give you both some fairy wings, of course. Now, these are not mixed reality. They will not respond to you, but they're augmented reality, so you can sell them with a little flap behind you. And then let's give ourselves Let's see, I need a Snapchat filter of a donkey. And let's add in a little backdrop and move this out of the way. And unfortunately, due to the limitations of the snap camera, I've got to be pretty close to get this bad boy to work. Well, that's not bad. It's starting to look like a thing. It's coming together. And now, and not now, holding for a second to queue up all the things a minute for the stage manager who's delaying the show on the fly. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, and now a spontaneous snippet of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick musk roses in thy sleek smooth <sighs> head, and kiss thy fair large eels and ears of my gentle joy. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready. Monsieur Cobweb, good Monsieur, get you your weapons in hand and kill me a red-hipped humble bee on the top of a thistle. And good Monsieur, bring me the honey bag. Do not fret yourself too much in the action. A uh, hey, 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 good Monsieur, have a care the honey bag break not. I would be loath to have you overflown with a honey bag, Senor. Uh, where's the Monsieur Mustard Seed? What's your will? Nothing but to help Calvary Cobweb to scratch. Ooh, I must have the barbers, Monsieur, for me thinks I am marvelous hairy about the face. And I am such a tender ass that if my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. <laughs> what will tell you some music, my sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear in music. Let's have the tongs and the bones. <laughs> or say, sweet love. What thou desirest to eat? Oh, truly a peck of provender. I could munch your good dry oats. 
Methinks I have a great desire for a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay, hath no filler. I have a venturous fetch. I'll seek the squirrel's hoard and fetch thee nuts. I'd rather a handful or two of your dried peas, but I pray you, let none of your people stir me. I have an exposition of sleep come over me. <sighs> when my cue comes, call me, and I will answer my next is most fair peerless. <laughs> Hi ho! Peter Quince. Flute the bell's mender. Snap the tanker. Starbling? God's my life. Stolen Henson left me asleep. <gasps> oh, I've had a most rare vision. <clears throat> I've had a dream. Past the wit of man to say what dream it was. <laughs> man is but an ass if he should expound about this dream. Methought I was. There is no man can tell what me thought I was. And methought I had. <laughs> man is but a patched fool if he should offer to say what me thought I had. <laughs> the eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is unable to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I, I, I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream, and it shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom and I shall sing it at the latter end of the play before the duke. Peradventure, to make it more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Oh, masters, I am to discourse wonders, but ask me not what, for if I tell you I am no true Athenian, I shall tell you everything, right as it fell out. <laughs> All I will say is that the duke hath dined. Get your apparel together. Good strings in your beards, new ribbons in your pumps. Meet presently at the palace. Every man look o'er his part, for the short and the long is our play is preferred. In any case, let Fisby have clean linen, and let not he who plays the lion pair his nails, for they shall hang out for lion's claws. And most dear actors, eat no onions nor garlic, for we are to utter sweet breath, and I do not doubt but to hear them say it is a sweet comedy. No more words. Away. Go away. And with that, let us thank our scene partners. Take a bow, and thank you so much. If you're gonna be stuck in a box or look like an ass, why not take action and try something new? An augmented reality donkey head, a virtual backdrop that can be summoned and manipulated with the touch of a button. Scene partners who can react and respond from anywhere in the world. Future storytelling for future audiences. And the future is very, very exciting. The Oculus game company Tender Cause hosted actors inside the Under Presents during quarantine and mounted their own production of Shakespeare's Tempest in virtual reality. The techno-dramatists have created their own proprietary app that augments the appearance and backdrops of their performers using their cell phones. Double Eye Productions sponsored their second theatrical production at the Venice Film Festival, turning the audience into an immersive Greek chorus. The Monarchs have been making 45-minute dance pieces inside of Second Life. Shattered Spaces created their own video conferencing platform to have their own customized interactions with a live audience for a non-linear story. The Wave Interactive created a virtual concert for the weekend inside of TikTok to over 2 million viewers. And the DJ Marshmallow hosted a virtual concert inside the video game Fortnite to 10.7 million concurrent viewers. Just for context, that is almost three times the amount of lifetime tickets sold to the hit Broadway sensation Hamilton. Nothing against Hamilton. I have never sold that many tickets. There's only so many seats in the theater, but this shows us how technological partnerships can scale 
to meet the audience and the artists wherever they are in the world. And right now, the world needs live entertainment to survive this tragic time. Shakespeare, of course, was no stranger to tragedy. The theater world of his day was inspired heavily by a global health event. Plague ripped through London, transmitted by fleas on the backs of rats in 1592, 1602, 1606, and 1665. London ultimately lost over 15% of its population. That's one in seven. As we stand here tonight, our own pandemic has robbed us of over 800,000 human lives. Like today in Shakespeare's time, those that could fled the cities. Parliament postponed, trade stopped, and theaters closed and reopened and reclosed again and again and again over several years while the death count rose and fell. We know so little about the life of William Shakespeare, but we do know that the death of his landlady, Mary Montjoy, due to illness, caused him to vacate his Silver Street residence. The ending of the London Boys Company made room for Shakespeare's company at the Blackfriar Theater. And it is thought he wrote Antony and Cleopatra while in isolation and toured his King's Men out of the city. These moments in history are not easy for anyone. I don't have the answers. Neither does Shakespeare. Neither does our friend Rosencrantz. That's the bit I don't like, frankly. That's why I don't think of it. Because you'd be helpless, wouldn't you? Stuffed in a box like that. I mean, you'd be in there forever. Even taking into account the fact that you're dead, it isn't a pleasant thought, especially if you're dead. We come to the part of the hero's journey known as the dark night of the soul. All hope is lost, and we are just trying to survive one more day. We find one of Shakespeare's most complicated hero villains, King Macbeth, who begins the play as a war hero until three witches plant the seed that he himself might one day be king. Five acts later, haunted by the irreversible consequences of his own ambition, he sits on the throne, insisting on wearing his armor even as the battle is already lost, waiting for the end. A woman's cry is heard off stage, and unceremoniously, we receive the news of the death of Lady Macbeth. A servant enters, the queen, my lord, is dead. And Macbeth responds, she should have died hereafter. There's much debate about this line, the word hereafter, its meaning. It could mean she's gone too soon. She should have died hereafter, later. The sentiment we all feel when robbed of someone we love. But it could also mean she's going to die anyway. She should have died hereafter. We all die. We all end up in a box. The callousness of a character who has seen and caused so much death. I never actually got to perform this speech. My own adaptation of the play called A Tale Told by an Idiot modernizes the story in the world of a virtual reality video game company. Three in-game avatars predict the future of the company <laughs> to an aloof, game tester Mac, and an ambitious coder Beth, who together see a path to control the company. To make our in-game scenes, we used an Xbox Kinect camera, which has a depth sensor on it for tracking players' movements and gestures. Now, with a little bit of fuss, you can actually hack this camera to capture skeletal data and movements. And then you can map these like bones, onto a 3D avatar to puppet it in real time. Oh, no! <laughs> Get back there and grab a quick little avatar just to turn myself into a different character real fast. There's this owl that I can fly around in real time. It is not the best motion capture in the world, but 
it cost practically nothing and it's fun to play with. The Xbox also can capture what is called volumetric video, which is basically just a 3D interpretation of what the depth camera sees. And this can be moved around to anywhere in the space. So even though the camera itself is not moving, it's trying to extrapolate what those data points would look like from that angle. It's very cool and it creates this ghost-like effect that really starts to lend itself towards holograms and holographic performance. And so if you'll indulge an actor, I'd like to bring this new dimension to Macbeth's final speech. She should have died hereafter. There would have been time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life is but a walking shadow. A poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Really ask yourself, if I asked you straight off, I'm going to stuff you in this box, now would you rather be alive or dead? We return to the original question from Rosencrantz, from William Shakespeare, from an actor with too many gadgets and far too much free time. If the whole world is going to be shoved into these crude boxes, do we want to be a part of it or not? My brother was hospitalized in February with this strange flu that the doctors didn't recognize. I still have nightmares of being by his bedside, unsure of his condition. Fortunately, he survived. I don't know that I could have survived the alternative. And a few weeks later, I developed the worst illness I've ever had in my life. I lost my voice completely and couldn't leave bed due to severe skeletal pain and fatigue. And if there's anything that you should take away from tonight, it is how difficult it is to get me to sit still and be silent. Immediately after my recovery, every major city in the world went under quarantine. Broadway and Hollywood shut down. So, I speak to you tonight as a fellow human who has genuinely feared the end of his life and career. But these explorations in virtual storytelling have given me new life, a second sunrise. If I'm going to be stuck in a box I choose to be alive. Naturally, you'd prefer to be alive. Life in a box is better than no life at all. I expect you'd have a chance at least. You could lie there thinking, well, at least I'm not dead. Immediately after my recovery, I was invited to that June conference and I was told we'd be doing talkbacks and meetups inside of a platform called Mozilla Hubs. I didn't know what that was and thought, let's find out. Now, much of the technology we've covered tonight falls into the category of social streaming, social gaming, or social media. But there's a whole other world of social VR, or social virtual reality. 
You may be familiar with platforms like Second Life and VR Chat, where you can meet up with anyone in the world represented by a virtual avatar. Mozilla has their own version of this called Hubs, which has a bit of a twist. Hubs can be accessed using the same URL on almost any device. So if you have a VR headset, fantastic. But if you don't, you can still access the experience using your computer web browser or your smartphone. They have a variety of template scenes and environments that you can drop in and use right away. Mozilla has a companion project called Spoke that allows you to be a virtual architect of your own 3D world without knowing any code. It took me about five minutes inside of Hubs and Spoke to realize what I wanted to do next. I wanted to create a virtual theater that anyone could use for free to start hosting live audiences right now. And so, welcome to the future stages, a virtual theater going experience that can be accessed on almost any device built on Mozilla hubs. Think of this like a website template, but for a 3D world. You simply grab the template, throw in your own artwork and live stream link, create a room, hit publish, and you are ready to host your event. And people are. Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop in Brooklyn hosted their Revolution Now series this August inside the future stages. The Actors Theater of Louisville approached me about onboarding their professional training company inside Mozilla Hubs. And just last weekend, I mounted an original one-act play inside this theater at the Here Festival. So, you would get your room link to attend. You use your mouse inside the room to click and drag to look around. Very nifty. And you can use your arrow keys to pilot your avatar around the room, kind of like a video game. You can go through the lobby here and into the theater. Now holding down spacebar, you'll see a variety of interactive options. For example, you have these emojis at the bottom to be able to express yourself in real time. And then you can click on these little waypoints to sit yourself in an actual seat. It's fantastic. Now, you can also activate your microphone and your web camera to be able to interact with other participants. And Mozilla uses spatialized audio. So the closer you are to something, the louder it is. And the further away you are from something, the softer it is, which allows you to have those sidebar conversations we can't really have on Zoom. Now, even though this experience works great on desktop, it really opens up on a headset. So if you don't mind, I'm going to continue the tour using a virtual reality headset called a Neo 2 from Pico. Get myself on stage here. And hello! The first thing you'll notice is that I get hands with my avatar in this experience, which allows me to really interact and explore the world in a much more natural way like grabbing this little cube here and being able to move it around with my hands. Fantastic. We don't need that anymore. Goodbye. <laughs> I can use the controllers to navigate around the space, or I can just walk around like I would in my room. Just want to be careful that you don't run into anything. I have stubbed my toes many times. Now, if this looks like playing a video game, it's even closer to making one. Having done some motion capture work, it can be a bit of a dance to coordinate the large, bulky helmet and the body trackers with an authentic performance. Even still, acting in video games is the closest I've come to theater acting in Hollywood. I can go anywhere, be anything, summon any object, and my collaborators can manipulate the environment and world around me in real time based off of discoveries that I make in character. One of these collaborators, David Gotchfield, says that theater is the original virtual reality, immersing audiences in imaginative worlds using light and sound and movement. As the entire world becomes virtual, more than ever, I hear the words of Jaquees 
from Shakespeare's As You Like It, that all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and entrances, and every man in his time plays many parts, their acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail, unwilling to school. And then the lover, sighing like the furnace with a woeful ballad made out to his mistress's eyebrow. And then the soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden in quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, with fair round belly and good cape on lined, his eyes severe and beard a formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth act shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose, pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turns again towards childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. In the end, we are alone in a box. All we have is our stories and each other. The final words of Stoppard's speech are ones of optimism, that if we can just hang on a little while longer, someone might come along to pull us out of our isolation. In a minute, someone's going to bang on the lid and tell me to come out. Hey, you. What's your name? Come out of there. I don't know what the future of theater will be, but I do know there will be a future and we will find it together. The fact is there are no perfect solutions and so there's no wrong answers. Maybe we'll use 360 video to give the audience control over where they watch or WebRTC, real-time communication servers, to give each audience member their own iteration of the experience. XR stages would allow us to control light and environment in real time. Or 3D projection software like L8 and Isadora could be repurposed to bring to life stunning virtual visuals. Or partnerships with AI, like the artificial intelligence that wrote all the music in tonight's show. The possibilities are limitless. And I hope tonight I've activated your curiosity. But these are just tools. Nothing replaces the human element, our connection to each other. We think of one of Shakespeare's last plays as The Tempest. The great sorcerer Prospero breaks his staff and swears off his spells and chooses to abandon his isolation to forgive his enemies and follow his newly wed daughter on her journey home. So, be free and fare thee well. Pray you, draw near. Now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have is mine own, which is most faint now, tis true. I must be here, confined by you, or else to Naples, let me not, since I have my dukedom got, and pardon the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. Gentle breath of yours, my sails must fill, or else my project fails, which was to please. Now I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer. 
which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. So you from crimes would pardon be. Let your indulgence set me free. In the end, we turn to each other. Storytellers need audiences, and audiences need stories. As we come to the end of a night of theater, I turn to you for your questions, thoughts, and ideas about the many boxes we've opened and closed in our brief time together. But first, allow me like Prospero to set down these spells and return to the words of Rosencrantz one final time. Do you ever think of yourself as actually dead? Buying in a box with the lid on it. Nor do I, really. Silly to be depressed by it. I mean, one thinks of it like being alive in a box. One keeps forgetting to take into account the fact that one is dead, which should make a difference, shouldn't it? I mean, you'd never know you were in a box. It would be just like you were asleep in a box. Not that I'd like to sleep in a box, mind you. Not without any air. You'd wake up dead for a start, and then where would you be? apart from inside a box. That's the bit I don't like, frankly. That's why I don't think of it. Because you'd be helpless, wouldn't you? Stuffed in a box like that, I mean, you'd be in there forever. Even taking into account the fact that you're dead, it isn't a pleasant thought. Especially if you're dead. Really ask yourself, if I asked you straight off, I'm going to stuff you in this box, now would you rather be alive? Or dead. Naturally, you'd prefer to be alive. Life in a box is better than no life at all, I expect. You'd have a chance, at least. You could lie there thinking, well, at least I'm not dead. In a minute, someone's going to bang on the lid and tell me to come out. Hey, you, what's your name? And we are back. Hello, Brendan. Hello. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. How's everybody else doing? That was incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much for that incredible talk. I mean, that wasn't a talk. That was a performance. Um, you're getting a standing O from our entire team here in the studio, and I'm sure everyone out there watching virtually as well. Um, that was incredible. Uh, I'm going to give you a moment because questions are coming in. So we are going to just jump right into a Q&A if that's okay with you. Um, that before good. we do, though, if you haven't sent in your questions yet and you do have questions for Brendan, how could you not? Um, you can still submit those by going to slido.com and entering the code future stages, all one word. That's slido, S L I D O.com with the code future stages. There we go. One more time. Slido.com with the code future stages. All right, let's dive right in, Brendan. Um, there's a lot of questions uh, about tech. Um, and I think to start, I know you, you definitely addressed this during the, the talk, during the performance. But just to reiterate, what would you say are the minimum requirements for a good future stages setup? Any equipment recommendations? Um, I think that everything that I tried to do tonight on the software side is free. Uh, that was really important to me. So the barrier to entry is you. Um, all of this technology is has at least a free trial version. Um, like I mentioned, the little $4 remote. 
um, app that it has 30 days free and then they start charging you. Um, so everybody should be able to just actually recreate everything that I did tonight with no money. It then gets into the question of, obviously I'm wearing a little microphone and I have a, a DSLR camera that I'm using as a web camera instead of just a normal web camera. So I think that I would say to begin rehearsing, we're used to rehearsing in non-traditional spaces, kind of scrappy spaces. So I think you can start rehearsing today using the software side and whatever tech you have. Um, we're actually right now using the scene partner trick that we did in the show using OBS Ninja to be able to have this Q&A. And that is completely free. And uh, last weekend we did um, a production inside the future stages and the actors used their cell phones with OBS Ninja to be able to beam their cameras into the theater. So it really is, I think in this era, if I'd said 10 years ago that we were all gonna have a camera in our pocket, I don't think anyone would have believed me, but you know, here we are today and a lot of people already have access to pretty good tech that'll at least get you to start standing up your story. And then you can really figure out what tech is needed to support the story and to support the performance in whatever enhancements you actually need to tell that story. And that's so. a great segue into works out of the box <laughs> yeah and that's a, a great segue into our next question um is there an app that would allow for the creation and delivery of original creative works one thing that zoom lacks is intimacy but using cell phones may allow for a longer form intimate experience that allows for movement for me that's what led me to things like social vr is that that has for better or worse uh been developed traditionally for a more intimate one-on-one -on -one experience. It's a lot of folks that have found themselves in isolation that are looking for connection online um, and then wanted to be represented either through anonymity or just through expressing themselves outside of a humanoid form. Um, and so I think that social VR spaces like the future stages, you can go to my website, which is brendanabradley.com forward slash future stages. There's a walkthrough on the space and then there's the template for free. So you can pull that down and start add in your own stuff and uh, see if it works for you. Um, and this is, we're still very early days, but there's a lot of really cool solutions to be able to start um, working with kind of full bodied performance and a lot more kind of on stage, on camera, on environment intimacy. Great. All right, they are flying in now, so we're gonna keep it moving. Uh, given the physical limitations of performing in a living room, do you think that this type of performance- What do you mean? <laughs> makes it easier or more difficult for performers with mobility issues to perform, or does it have no effect? Um, sorry, I just wanted to, now that I'm so much closer to the camera, I thought I would adjust my focus. Um, I don't know that I can speak to accessibility, what I can, for myself personally, um, but I definitely think that this technology, if your accessibility is that you can operate a keyboard or a camera, um, I think that you have the ability to then perform. Um, and we've seen that with a lot of YouTube culture, right? We've seen a lot of really interesting, fascinating, um, non-traditional performers and performances that come out of the ability to basically go live from anywhere. And so I think embracing that um, to define for yourself what theater is, um, I, I think that it's more accessible because I'm I'm the guy that used to like stand in Times Square with my little postcards trying to get like three people to come to my show. Um, and so the idea that now I can I can email you, I can find you and I can invite you to my thing uh, is pretty cool. Um, I think there's more people in the audience right now than we're at most of the plays I produced early <laughs> in my career. So. Great. Uh, a lot of great uh, compliments, of course. This is incredible. Is there any way to green screen yourself onto the Future Stages platform, or do you have to be an animated version of yourself? Uh, yes. So when you're in the Future Stages, I'm trying to think if there's a clean way to do this. Um, I will think on it. But basically, the Future Stages within it has the ability to make your webcam activate. And so you can put yourself into the future stages as a video. Um, and they just released this thing that the community has been asking for for a long time that's kind of been called sticky walls, which is basically you can create an area of the 3D world that will just grab whatever you put on it. So if you put an image there, or if you put an object there, or if you put a video there, it then just sticks it 
so that you can kind of, you don't have to sit there and kind of adjust it on the fly. You know it's going to land where you want it to land. So the play that we did this weekend was about three people in a boat, in a life raft, um, floating out in the ocean. So we turned the floor of the theater into an ocean. We got a 3D boat that we put in the middle of the theater. And then we did basically what you and I are doing right now, where we composited the actors inside of OBS and our stage manager made their camera, their web camera, the video inside the future stages. And it looked like you had three actors in a boat together, which was really cool. And we were all, one actor was in San Francisco, I was uh, in Los Angeles, and another actor was in New York. And all the three of us were in the same boat, which was pretty cool. That is really cool. And on that note, there's a question of how can, how can people, f if they're interested in this type of work, this virtual theater, where do they go to find performances like this? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, there are so many. I, I mean, I feel like everybody in the world right now is trying to do some type of a virtual performance or a virtual season or a virtual festival. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I can tell you, if you just Google the word virtual theater, um, it, it's kind of endless. A lot of that is kind of Zoom plays where we did kind of latch onto that and that is a very comfortable thing for folks to do. But there's all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, I think the, 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 big, the big one right now that folks are talking about is a headsetted experience, um, which is the Tempest, which is in the Under Presents, which is an Oculus game. So you go inside this video game and you go one way and you play the video game. And if you go the other way, you go to a theater and you can buy a ticket and go in the lobby and watch them do a production of the Tempest, which is pretty cool. Um, but you have to have a headset for that. So I think that finding this hybrid medium where there's the accessibility for anybody, kind of content or platform agnostic, um, but that there is then kind of these enhancements if you do have the ability to have hands or an avatar to participate in the story. Um, there's all, all sorts of stuff going on. And so our next uh, question is they're looking for some green screen help. So they've done a few shows with green screens, and one of their biggest cool. stressors is the actual green screen. How do you keep the screens looking well and not dark in parts? How do you get rid of green line around the body, frizzy hair solutions? Uh, so much awesome stuff, they said. So what I can say, it's, it's not a sexy answer. Um, I'm trying to, I think his name is Andrew Price. He's a 3D modeler. Um, and he has one of my favorite quotes where he says, it's not hard, it just takes a lot of time. Um, and basically what you're trying to do is your unique setup, you're just gonna have to dial in again and again and again. I, I've been working in this space, I, I think James approached me about this maybe three or four months ago. Um, and I've, I've performed this in every square inch of my one bedroom apartment to figure out where the right space would be. I actually have a giant window over there that I thought like, oh, this is gonna make so much nice light. It's gonna look so pretty and the green screen will just go away. It, it made it worse. So I have to close off that window to be able to perform the show. Um, and, and it really is just kind of dialing it in. What I can tell you is the most important thing to do is you're always gonna to wanna to light the backdrop separately from yourself. So this needs to have its own lighting going on to be completely clean and consistent as a color for the most part. And then you're gonna to wanna to light the actor completely independently of that. Um, OBS actually has probably the nicest built-in chroma key that I've used. Um, most other, even like if you were, when I've done like film film work where we've tried to green screen somebody, even using kind of post-production tools for filmmaking, I, I don't think do as quite a, a, good, a good a job as OBS, just because I think OBS kind of just discards, it's probably cutting off a lot of other weird stuff. Um, but I think that it kind of just ignores what doesn't work for it. And so you don't get those kind of green cutout figures, but yeah, it's, it's just kind of dialing it in brick by brick, which I think we have the advantage as theater makers that we're used to rehearsals. So I think every rehearsal, rather than treating tech as something that happens at the end of the production, I think tech starts day one and you're working with the actors to kind of optimize mm -hmm. their rehearsal space and their performance space so that you can make sure everybody looks good by the time you get to tech rather than trying to solve all these problems once you've got a show on its feet. That's great. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Uh, 
so it's kind of a two-parter. So Future Stages is a free software, so I anyone can go online and, and download it and, and create in Future Stages. So a question about why you why you thought it was important. Sorry, James. I think my my Bluetooth is just kind of fritzing on us, so I'm going to put the other one in. No problem. Can you hear me now? Are you there? Can you hear me now? Let's. Technology. I'm glad it held out this long. Yeah. Look at us go. <laughs> oh no. All right, let's steal the other mouse from the other computer. This is this is the good news about having so much tech sitting around. While we we deal with a lot of tech. Can you hear me? Great. I heard you I heard you great over by the computer. Who would have thought? <laughs> great. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. All right. So as I was saying, the the you the future stages is free. Anyone can go online and create in the the software and the technology. Was there a reason why you thought it was important to keep this free and not, you know, try to monetize on it at a time when you probably could have done so successfully? And then the second part of that question is, how does one monetize performances like this in order to compensate actors and creative teams? Absolutely. Um, I think that. So much of what is happening right now in what is the XR or extended reality community is kind of falls under the umbrella of what they call the open web. And they are very much a culture of abundance and a culture of generosity and of kind of helping each other um, and, and being open source. And it felt disrespectful for me to, as kind of a visitor in this sandbox, to enter this community and to dictate my monetization or my value system onto someone else's culture. And instead, I wanted to honor the culture of the open source community that I'm, I didn't make Mozilla, I didn't make hubs. So it feels kind of icky for me to then go like, but I'm going to make money when you want to use this one little thing that is piggybacked on so much other incredible work that people were generous with. For so sure. for me, it's more important that artists have the tools to be able to get to work. And then you can hire me as an actor. I'll take that money. Um, but I think for me, it's, it's I, I really wanted to provide people with the toolkit. As far as monetization, things like hubs, for example, work the exact way that people are monetizing and transactionalizing Zoom plays in that you get a room link that you basically are sending out based off of the price of a ticket. Um, you can also build in points of sale within the 3D environment. You know, people could buy objects inside the environment, or you can have click-through links for donations and things like that. Um, getting outside of the social VR element, the social streaming community has really embraced a lot of great monetization strategies that I think that we just all should be utilizing. You know, you look at things like tipping and subscriptions on platforms like Twitch. You look at the ability to sell um, product and uh, fundraise money through social platforms like Facebook and Instagram. Um, I, I think there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of new ways to convert value um, in the online space, and I think that performers and producers should absolutely be working together to figure out ways to convert that value. Um, and so, if if this is one little way to help out, then I want to do that. Uh, Heather Harvey from Black Revolutionary Theater Workshop had has a beautiful quote from having used the future stages is she said, because all the tools we're using are free, it allows me to put more money in the pockets of black creatives. And to me, that that culture just highlights exactly what I think we should all be moving towards as far as let's help each other stand up the productions and then we can sell tickets and posters on the back end of that. That's amazing. And a couple more questions. Do you think that virtual tech like this might help to make live theater more accessible to more people. And we kind of talked about that earlier, but it, having it live in this virtual realm, do you think it will sort of help to democratize it a little bit more? Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that also kind of echoes the idea of making sure that this doesn't become, um, traditionally theater has been, the, uh, there's been a big barrier to entry for a price tag. Um, and so, you know, getting rehearsal space, getting performance space, getting marketing, um, even getting the rights to certain plays can be expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so in some ways, the fact that the tools are now 
free or there are tools that are free allow you to really stand up the work um, and it becomes anybody's game. And I think in this moment, it allows anybody to thrive. And especially to your, I, I think what answers your point is you, whether you consider what I just did theater or not, I do. I, I feel like I got the rush of coming out on stage in front of a live audience. I built in moments in the show to engage with folks. I built in moments that for me were um, kind of a roller coaster of my own journey combined with character journeys, combined with um, different modes of performance. And so that's not something I would have been able to do mm -hmm. in this moment in history uh, if I didn't have the technology. And so I think that this has the ability to at least, if it's six months, if it's 18 months, if it's a new hybrid medium that we start doing full time, um, whatever it takes to get us back on stage and to get us back uh, engaging with each other. Um, I think that art is, is crucial in this moment. Um, and, and I think that this technology has the ability to, to, to your point, democratize it and, and give more people more access. That's wonderful. And so speaking of how you did what you did, there's obviously a ton of questions about how many cameras you use and how you zoomed um, and a lot of love for the whole talk, but especially the first 10 minutes or so. Um, and sure. uh, disbelief that that was done live and in the moment. So can you talk a little bit about how all of this came to be in the moment? Yes. Um, why don't we, yes. Why don't we open up the, I can kind of take control of everything and just take you through the first couple of cues maybe. Um, so let's see, we'll go into just, this is my, my kind of standard camera. Ah, there's my pre-show. So here's just, I've removed everything from my room. I'm matting out the parts the green screen doesn't cover. Oh, that's another tip for the green screen folks. Um, you just mat, mat out uh, using an image mask the parts that you don't have a green screen for. Um, I'm using one camera for the entire show. There's one camera on a tripod right here. It's a DSLR camera. It's a 4K, it, it shoots in 4K, uh, which gives me a lot of data that's, that's four times the size of HD. And we're probably only streaming in HD given Wi-Fi signals and stuff. So that gives me a lot to work with. And so this opening cue is, is kind of a beast, um, but I wanted to kind of go all out and show in this opening number all the things that happen. So what you're gonna see when I first go to the first cue of the show is I asked the Museum of Boston, uh, the Museum of Science to give me a, what's called a plate shot in filmmaking, which is an empty shot of their theater. And they went in the theater and rolled on an empty stage. And I'm just looping that video for several seconds throughout the show to give myself a bare stage to composite myself on top of. So we've got that video. I fade it to black. And then I fade up from black into nothingness. So it's basically like a transparency or what's called an alpha layer, which will then, as the black subsides, reveal whatever is underneath it, which in this case is my live video. So we'll see this first cue of the show. Lights down. I've got my little music cue that plays. The lights go down. Now it's black. And now it's going to come up. And it's just going to be me standing on stage with, with my chair very professionally. Excellent. Now, what I did was I had my Snapchat filter ready to go here to put my little clown makeup on. I have this gorgeous backdrop from Amir Cohen, who is an incredible stage and lighting designer. And he's used to literally designing huge events like you know eurovision type stuff and he builds all of his mock-ups virtually and then you know delivers them to fabricators to build trusses and light grids and stuff like that and i said whoa what if we just skipped the last part and just can we make your mock-up so that it interacts with green screen video which is pretty cool um, i'm going to guess that this is a little glitchy for you all because the snapchat camera uh is just kind of chugging on all of this um, but basically what I'm showing you is I've got my backdrop from a mirror, myself, this little Snapchat filter for my makeup, and then I added a silhouette, which is basically just a clone of the camera that then I take out all of the saturation, all of the brightness. You can see a little lag on it if I don't stand still. And that allowed me to remove the kind of front lighting at the very beginning of the show. So I basically rehearsed it out that I know 
when this little whoosh sound effect happens, I'm going to take off that silhouette. Now, there are these things called motion transitions that are a plugin you can get inside of, I'm sure this is, let me just go back to just me because it's so glitchy with the snap camera. Now, this is the real camera, not the Snapchat camera. So um, the, uh, the motion transitions allow you, they're supposed to be like kind of whip pans or quick little bump ins. And so what I did was I said, okay, what I can do is I can basically Q2 is just Q1 stretched. So we go to Q1, we see all those things. And if I click on Q2, it's going to just slowly try to go to that stretched out image, which is going to look like I zoomed in. So we'll go back to Q1. I'll let this overlay play out where, so this is the, the overlay of the theater, fade up from black into nothingness to reveal me underneath it. And now I click on Q2, which is just Q1 zoomed in. And the computer now has to extrapolate that we've got to make basically go into this second move smoothly, which looks like and feels like a zoom, which is super cool. Um, and then I wanted to get out of that to kind of remove the makeup from my face, reset the space. And so I just dissolved into a wide here. And I've taken that same silhouette thing that was covering my face earlier, and I've just thrown it on the floor at a 45 degree angle to make a little bit of a shadow. So that's a real time shadow that'll kind of badly follow me around, but it's enough for the, for the moment. And then you'll see these overlays are just happening <laughs> over top of me. These are just augmented reality, just like the theater, just like the fade up from black. I just have a transparent image happening over a video playing over top of me. And I've rehearsed it with sound effects that I know when it's coming, I know when to stretch it, and I know when to step into it. And then that gives me the, the effect of I'm manipulating this cube, but it's just like a dance. It's just like a 3D projection that you would have um, in a traditional theater show. I'm just responding to essentially a light or a projection cue. The next cue is that tunnel. Um, and that is all a mirror. That is like, I wanted this sexy thing where I got shoved in a box and we went on a little bit of a ride just to break us out of the world. And that's 3D projection at its finest and it's super sexy. But to get there, we need to cover me with a transition, with a transparent object. And then we need to switch out from this cue to the next cue. And we do that again using standard OBS traditions. And these are called stinger transitions. Whereas you just need something to cover the frame for a brief moment so that you can wipe to the next cue. So it's basically Q3, this is, so this thing's gonna cover me and it's gonna switch out to Q4 without anybody knowing. Bam. And we're in Q4. And then that just keeps going until it explodes on the floor and then it quickly wipes up. And when I'm standing, you can see how bad that looked. But if I sold it by laying down on the floor and standing up with the camera movement like I rehearsed, it looks like the camera is moving and the world is shifting. And all that is is just a trick of the eye like a magician um, or a dancer might do, um, or, or even things that we've done with 3D projection in the past. Then this is just a stage that comes up. It lives here until I fire the next cue. When I fire the next cue, it sinks into the floor and the lighting effect changes just like a lighting cue. So I'll go to the ground and this lighting cue covers me. And now this is gonna just start spinning. And there's yet again, another one of those zoom cues where I've just taken this same cue and embedded it in the next cue so that it goes really wide. And it's gonna live here until I transfer to the next cue, which I'm doing this now with a mouse and I should be doing it with my phone. But here we are. And I now I just stand up quickly and I'm in this world. And a cube's gonna come down when I hear that sound effect. Um, and I kind of have rehearsed that that's like sternum level. I've gotta be more on my mark. Um, but I now know that I can sit here and this is just looping over top of me for as long as I could take. So I could vamp, I could, I could really lean into a moment, I could chew the scenery a little bit and it's just gonna keep on looping until I decide I'm gonna throw this cue away or this cube away, which is just a ripple transition, again, standard in OBS, that I'm just gonna throw it and jump. 
and now I've just made my video smaller so it feels further away. The world feels a lot larger and I can sit here and perform um, until I'm ready to summon my volumetric. And that's the, I think that's technically the only pre-recorded moment in this sequence is I've pre-recorded myself doing the volumetric stuff like you see me do later live with Macbeth. Um, I just wanted to create a second version of myself to come out of my body. And I sold it like this and then stepped away and then fusses at me with like, hey, you, what's your name? Come out of there. And I go into the final cue of the opening sequence, which I just want to sell with a little jump to get me from way up here to land me back down on stage to immediately start the show. And that's <laughs> how I, uh, that's a very slow walkthrough <laughs> to kill all of the magic, all of the mystery um, for how the opening was done. No, it made it more magical, I think. Um, and that feels like that behind the scenes look just feels like the best way to wrap up uh, this wonderful evening with you, Brendan. Do you have any final words for everyone out there watching? Um, I end all of my YouTube tutorials with a little mantra, which is now go create something. And so um, I'm very findable on the internet. You can come find me at Brendan A. Bradley, any of the places, but please invite me to the stuff that you create because I think we're all artists and we all want to get through this thing together. So go create something. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a joy to collaborate with you and see you work within and have our team work within this amazing platform. Everyone out there, go check it out, create. Um, I need to thank our friends at the Lowell Institute for making tonight possible once again, and all of you for joining us and spending your Wednesday night with us. We appreciate it so much. We hope you will continue to do so. Until then, stay safe and stay well, and thank you so much. <laughs>